So we're just going to wait like a few minutes to let people start like hopping in. Hopefully people got our reminder emails. And if not, this is being recorded. So even if people are not on here today um, or only a few people are on here, people still have the opportunity to um, see it later. So yeah. So even if people don't end up coming on, we wouldn't even know. But yes, you, we are recording it. So it's going to go onto our YouTube and people can watch it on our YouTube. Perfect. Sorry, guys. I know this is like the most awkward part of the whole panel. That's why I say I like the personal part. I know. <laughs> Look into my eyes. I'll tell you no lies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Just give people a few minutes. And feel free if you want to just, um, if you want to just mute and turn off your camera until we start. We're going to start at about 7.05 if you want to do that. If you don't want to, you can totally just stay on. I know guys this part is so awkward sometimes but for those that are um on the attendees that are on already uh we're gonna start at about 705 so just chill out maybe get some water get some pop get some coffee get your dinner and um yeah we're gonna start shortly
Okay, hello to all of um, our attendees who are in the um, panel right now. Um, thank you guys for being here today. We're going to start in about two to three minutes, so just hang tight. Um, thank you guys for being on time. Thank you guys for being like, early. I really appreciate it, and we're going to start very shortly. Okay, so let's get started. Um, for those of you, again, that are on here, thank you so much for being here this evening. I'm really, really excited to have this conversation. Um, I'm really excited for everybody to be a part of this conversation. I think it's one that's really needed. I think it's one that's important for our community, um, the Caribbean community as a whole, and even those that want to be a part or enjoy the Caribbean festivities. I think it's really important that we have this conversation and we really understand what it's all about. Um, so again, thank you all for being here. I'm just going to dive um, right into it. My name is Ashley. I am the founder of the Brown Girl Diary. And Brown Girl Diary is a platform that is cultivating, creating, and collaborating to understand and, un and uncover the Indo-Caribbean women's experience surrounding identity and culture. So we do things from virtual events, we do virtual panels, we um, have our own blog, and we're also working on tons of different projects where we're developing a membership for Indo-Caribbean women to be a part of, where they can come together and um, be a part of different workshops, be a part of different um, series, be a, a part of a, a bunch of different things where they can kind of understand their culture and also just have women that look like them to look up to. Um, but for this panel today, we're actually um, collaborating with the whole Caribbean community to understand this important, important topic, the hypersexuality of Caribbean women through carnivals and caravanas and all these different festivities that we have. Um, a lot of times, carnival can be portrayed as a very misogynistic um, cultural experience where women's bodies are shown off as sexualized for the benefit of masculine ideas. To outsiders, it could be frowned upon and displays nothing but sex and money. To those that are indulged in the culture, however, we see it differently. We see it as expression, we see it as experience, and we see it as a lifestyle. And there's so much more that we see it as, but just to sum it up, I, I think that that kind of does the trick. Um, but Carnival is a part of who we are and we work hard each and every day to celebrate through the experience. Today we're going to explore these ideas and when it comes to designing and purchasing costumes, the negative and questionable comments from our communities and um, sorry, the communities that we're a part of and of course the media's portrayal of these ideas because media is such a big thing now. It's really important for us to understand how they see and view these ideas and why are women seen as only sexual beings to the outside world and what we sh and what uh, approach we should have in response to tackling these ideas. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce everybody to the panel. Um, everybody's just gonna take about two to three minutes to introduce who they are, what they do, um, why this topic is important to them, and also your cultural background. I think that part is also very important. So um, why don't we start with Nadelle? Nadelle, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us who you are. Hi, I thank you, Ashley, for inviting me to this panel. I think it's really important for us to have a place to have these conversations and um, I'm really thankful to be here. So thank you. Um, my name is Nadell. I was the 2019 face of Toronto Carnival. Um, I've been playing mass for many, many years, 15 plus years. And I've worked with many of the mass bands in uh, the city. Um, I've worked with the mass bands, also with uh, the FMC, the governing body for our carnival, as well as other stakeholders. But my main mission was uh, when I created a body positive movement called Everybody Play a Mass, which the main goal is to showcase diversity in carnival and have a safe space where everybody of different shapes, sizes, colors, can feel welcome and know that it is an inclusive area and um, I didn't want, I wanted everybody to feel like they could be comfortable in participating um, in any carnival. Um, my background, I'm, I was born in Toronto. My parents are Dominican and I am Afro-Caribbean. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that intro, Nadelle. And, uh, intro, Nadelle, sorry. And everybody should check out Everybody Play a Mass. It's an amazing movement and it's really important to the topic that we're talking about today, which is why I need a Tafra on this panel. So make sure you guys check it out. Nadelle, you can drop your ads in the, um, in the chat section if you want to, so everybody can check it out and follow you and support you. Um, but why don't we move on to Carabella Mass? Why don't you guys introduce who you are and um, why you're a part of this panel today? Okay. So thank you very much for having us, Ashley. Uh, just like Nadelle said, it's um, the hypersexualization of Caribbean women, specifically during uh, Carnival, is very dear to our heart, um, considering that we are designers, producers, and uh, reproducers of uh, Carnival costumes with the Toronto Revelers. Um, Carabella Mass it consists of myself, so I'm Kateri. This is my sister, Vanessa, and unfortunately, Cicely was not able to make it today, but she is here in spirit, and um, we, we basically um, have established this brand called Carabella as a means to <clears throat> create masks with a cause. Um, when designing our costumes, we try to be as diverse and as inclusive as possible. Uh, we have been inspired by many other Caribbean individuals, women, such as Nadelle. Hello. Uh, her Everybody Play a Mass really uh, struck great thought within us for us to not just cater to the typical rock hard body um, model that you would see on stage um, modeling our costumes, but to cater to every single shape and size. And being Caribbean women, we know that we're not just a size zero. We're not just a size 22. We range from shade, color, shape, size, you name it. Um, so pretty much Carabella is there um, to just kind of fuse our heritage, which is, uh, of we're of Guyanese and Trinidadian descent. Um, we could be considered three red women because we are mixed. Uh, we are of African descent, we are of uh, European descent, um, of Indian descent, and we're also of indigenous descent and indigenous to the West Indies. Uh, so we look forward to having the discussion with you and thank you very much again for having us. Perfect. Um, well, thank you for that intro. Um, you guys are literally like the whole package. You're like a little bit of everything. So we're going to get lots of different ideas from you guys. Um, but Bianca, why don't you go ahead and give us a quick little intro about who you are and why you're here today. Hi, my name is Bianca. Ashley, thank you for having me on here with these great women. And I'm going to say happy, happy Equality Day because we were talking about that before. Um, I've been in playing Carnival and absorbing all of it for about 40 years now. Um, I'm a mom who is passing that on to my two boys and I know what it's like to be sexualized during carnival and that's why this conversation is so important. Um, it's our culture and how we love it and how we view it. We still have to teach many about what it is and I think this is such an important discussion to have and especially today when we talk about women's equality, it's so important and I am of Trinidadian descent. So I, I know it's so funny because I didn't know that today was women equality, but I guess everything happens for a reason. So that's the universe working its magic. So yeah, we're all meant to be here today. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, but um, why don't you go ahead, uh, Selena, my very good friend. I'm really excited to have her on this panel today. Um, but yeah, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and what you do and how amazing you are. <laughs> well, hi everybody. My name is Selena, um, better known as for Carnival. Thank you again, Ashley, for having me on the panel. I think it's a really important discussion, as everyone said. Um, currently, right now, I own Tribal Carnival, one of the mass brands in Toronto. We also uh, have a mass brand in Cayman Islands, and we do a few other countries as well. Um, I also have my own swimmer collection. It's called Seaver Collection. Um, that is catering to people with bigger chests sizes because I myself you know I have a bigger chest size but I'm also very small so kind of goes with the discussion today we come in all shapes and sizes um with the hyper and I'm of Trinidadian descent I'm Indo-Caribbean my mom is black and my dad is Indian so I'm a dogla um 
And yeah, I'm excited to discuss what we're going to talk about today. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for your intro. And before we get into um, the conversation today, we're going to have Cindy, who is um, our outreach coordinator with Brown Girl Diary. Um, Cindy, if you want to give us a little intro about what you do and why you're a part of Brown Girl Diary, um, you can go right ahead. And then you can also do the land acknowledgement for us as well. Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Cindy, and I'm the community outreach officer for BGD. Um, for me, BGD, I'm actually half Trinidadian and half Tamil. So BGD was a space for me to kind of be able to resonate and find a community within the Indo-Caribbean community because I know we talk a lot about the exclusion that you find in South Asian community as being um, Indo-Caribbean. So I've definitely faced that within my own family um, and community. So finding BGD has helped me really grow into myself and my identity. Um, so I'm very grateful for these spaces and to be able to talk about things like the hypersexualization a uh, Caribbean woman in general. I know I went away to Queens University and I remember my first week there um, saying Caribbean people throw the best parties and someone said, bet you all got pregnant. And it was one of those really shocking moments for me. And I cried, it was my first week. I was a first year little kid and I was like, oh my God, like why are people so mean? And I was like, why are people stereotyping us Caribbean women? The way that we dance, the way that we express our bodies. How can I not be an academic, but also whine on the dance floor? Like, you know, so all of these different things you know, are things that I think are really important for us to have a conversation around. So I'm excited for today's conversation. Um, but with that being said, I just wanted to start off with a little land acknowledgement. Um, so before we start, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that today we're situated, I'm saying this from where I'm situated, which is in Oshawa, Ontario, um, on traditional Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek and Mississauga territory. Today, I ask you to imagine what this very space may have looked like hundreds of years ago. I want you to take away the buildings, the roads, the stoplights. I want you to think about the people that have walked this land before us, those that have worked this land, and those that have protected these lands. And I want you to thank them. I want you to remember those that were displaced from this land, those that were physically and violently removed from this land, and those that laid down their lives trying to stay on this land. I want you to remember them. I ask you to join me in tapping into our own histories and positionalities, whether you, you sustain and live off of this land today as a native, a settler, an immigrant, a refugee, or a visitor, I ask that you reflect on what that means, how we call this place home, that we've invaded the home of others. I invite you to reflect on how your privilege allows for you to benefit from the colonial structures in place while continuously keeping indigenous communities marginalized and oppressed. I use this land acknowledgement as a call to action, one in which I ask you to keep in mind that this isn't just history. Indigenous communities are still being displaced, mistreated, neglected as we speak, all while continuing to protect this land. This isn't history repeating itself. This is a colonial project that has never actually stopped. We owe it to our Indigenous brothers and sisters to listen, to learn, and most importantly, to respect. Perfect. Thank you so much for that land acknowledgement. Um, it sounds beautiful, actually. So <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm just going to dive right into it. So um, just for those who just tuned in, thank you guys so much for being a part of this conversation today. Um, it is about the hypersexualization of Caribbean women uh, through carnivals and through caravanas and through all these festivities that we celebrate. Uh, and I'm going to get right into the first question because I'm everybody has already gone through their intros and everybody has... Um, kind of introduce who they are and why they're a part of this panel. So uh, let's dive right into it. So our first question today and our first topic of discussion on the table is um, the art of the designing the costumes, but also selecting your costumes for the road. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this part is because I was having a conversation with my um, partner's grandma and you know, I had came home from like Caravana one day and she's like, oh yeah, you know, like I used to love going down to the festival. And then, you know, I just see all these women and they're looking like this and they're looking like that. And, you know, very like aggressive words. And I was like, oh, like, you know, it's it was really heartbreaking because she used to love it. And she grew up in Trinidad and she would always go to Carnival and celebrate this. And their family had a big um, mass band and all these different things. So it was really heartbreaking to hear what she had to say about the festival now. Um, but it was also very like eye opening to see what she had to say about it from the past. So I think it was really important for us to talk about this um, because a lot of you are um, designers of costumes. So I think it would be really cool to understand like kind of your, I guess you could say your theory behind designing the costumes and what that process looks like, or even just like being a part of the mass camp and seeing these costumes being designed and also just being on the road. And when you go to the mass camp to pick your costume, what is that experience like for you? And what are some of the things that kind of stop you from picking costumes um, 
depending on what they look like and depending how you think they're going to make you feel and why. So I'm going to start with Nadelle. Um, Nadelle, why don't you just go ahead and just talk to us about what that experience has been like for you when it comes to selecting costumes, designing costumes, and of course, you're always in the mass camp. So what, do you, what has that been like for you? So um, I guess personally, when I started playing mass, I just got into it. I knew it was part of my culture. It was something that my family has been doing and I was just always watching and wanted to participate. So when it was my turn to start, I just started. I didn't even think twice. Um, but one thing I did notice was when I was playing mass and um, women, some women would come up to me and tell me things like they wish they had my confidence, they wish they could participate, but there was something holding them back or they had some sort of doubt. And that was one of the reasons that I started Everybody Play a Mass. And one of the first things I did was reach out to um, all of the mass fans in our city and letting them know about the importance of showcasing diverse bodies um, in their media, in their publication. And I think that was a way for people to see that uh, there's, there are different shapes and sizes being represented. It's not just, um, you know, certain, like a small size or certain shapes or sizes that you would normally see. Um, and I think a lot of bands, and there's been a transition where you are seeing a lot more plus size or different shades, different, like just so much diversity on stage. I think there's a lot of work to do, but I have seen a change. And um, this also helps to make people feel like they can play back. And I've also, like you said, worked in the mass camp. I have been uh, managing the models and talent for Toronto Revelers for a couple of years. And um, working in the mass band, I've seen people come in and you know, be skeptical to, to register or to put on a costume. And one thing I've always pushed is, you know, you can have alterations. You can, you know, find ways that you can feel comfortable. And I think once you're comfortable, your confidence will grow and you will be able to go out on the road and not have to worry or not have as much doubt. Um, and not to say it's easy. <laughs> um, I struggle with that as well. Sometimes I'm like, am I really gonna go out and wear this? But you know, it is something that like Cindy said in her intro, it's, you know, it's part of who we are and um, after you get on the road, you know, nobody's really paying attention to that anymore. So <laughs> we spent so many months worrying about, you know, how we're going to look or what our costume's going to look like. And then you get on the road and it's... And half your costumes is gone in the first like hour and a half because you are like, forget it, I don't want to wear it. Um, but there, you brought up a couple of really good points. And um, one thing that I wanted to touch on right from the beginning is that I think when we think about like the sexualization or sexuality of women um, when it comes to Carnival and Carabana, we automatically think of like, um, and I think, I think um, Katari, you guys had said it um, in your intro was just, um, just we just think of like a sexy body, you know, we think of like that hard body, but sometimes it's not even about that. It's about like how women, um, and when we say sexuality and sexualization, we're talking about how all types of women feel, right? Like women who may not be that um, general painted picture of what we think it is when we hear that word, but it's all different body types. And Nigel, you also talked about something else that I wanted to touch on. I actually didn't think about it until you mentioned it. Um, but when you're picking models, and I want you guys to be open and transparent about it, like honestly, how you kind of go about this and why you go about it that way. Because um, I really think it's important for us to kind of look into these ideas and be like, maybe assess ourselves, like, why are you being critical of something more than other things, right? So why, why do certain things look a certain way? Um, would be an interesting thing to talk about as well. So I don't know if you want to touch on that or if you want to pass it along, um, but definitely something to keep in mind. Um, I'll just touch a little bit more on like model selection um, because I have worked with both Selena with Tribal and Kateri with Toronto Revelers. And I do think that once you showcase, the more diversity you showcase, the more people are comfortable playing with your band or your section. So I think, uh, well, I don't design. So I can't really talk on the design of costumes, but I do think it's really important for designers to understand the impact that uh, people feel if you show 
somebody that they can see themselves being represented in on stage at a band launch or in any media publications that you put out on social media or print. Yeah, 100%. And I think um, even just not a uh, Carabana itself, but just like Carnival. Like I remember when I was going to Trinidad for Carnival for the first time, I swear it was like way more stressful than anything else because I was so scared. Like, you know, you hear all these stories about like, oh, you're, you know, if you have to send in your pictures, you have to post your pictures, you have to get accepted. Um, certain bands don't want certain women looking a certain way. So you don't even know if you should try to get a costume with a certain band. So I think there's a lot of things that are like packed onto these ideas as well, especially with Trinidad Carnival. Um, because I guess when we're the outsiders looking in again, from that side, that's what it feels like sometimes. And it's almost like very, very stressful to the point where you're like, I don't even know if I want to go this year because I didn't reach my body goals yet. So maybe I shouldn't even attend and maybe I shouldn't be a part of the celebration. So I think when we are kind of being devil's advocate about it, that's something that's really important to think about. But I also think like you said, Nadelle, um, there are a lot of people who are being mindful of how they select models and how they kind of manage these processes. So they're making sure that everybody feels inclusive. And I think that's one of the best things that are happening right now over the years is just like that change in the women that we see and how we perceive beauty. Um, but Selena, uh, why don't you go ahead and talk about um, what it's like for you designing costume? Cause you're always designing costumes even when it's not carnival season. So, and caravan season. So why don't you just talk about um, that process for you and what that looks like um, in terms of like the hypersexualization of women? Uh, for me, I've been like, I was literally born into this. I. I saw the whole evolution of, you know, it going from big feather headpieces to be friends, you know, big, big belts, to just, you know, a panty and a bra and, you know, a tiara most times. Um, so I've seen that kind of evolution, but I think what a lot of people from the outside looking in don't understand is that just like carnival is like fashion, like just like fashion evolves, carnival is evolving every single year. And a lot of people, look to Trinidad Carnival. Trinidad Carnival is like the mega. That's what everyone looks to for their inspiration for that following year. Um, so a lot of the the stuff you see on road is, it stems from Trinidad. And a lot of the stuff that Trinidad's doing isn't too inclusive. Like how you said, um, there are VIP sections where you have to send in your photo. And if you don't look a certain way, you can't get into that section. So for those type of things, I don't agree with that at all as a designer. Um, you also have the designers that I feel like you need to have designers. There are some that just get into it just for the money aspect. They're not in it for, um, you know, for the designing aspect and to make people feel comfortable. So there's a lot of designers that don't know how to make stuff inclusive. They just don't know how to do it. They're, they're doing it for the money aspect and not for the actual cultural aspect. Um, when it comes to us designing, I mean, we try to be as inclusive as possible um, while we're, you know, still making things look nice. You also, you also have the designers who make things inclusive, but they just don't look as nice as the ones that you make for the smaller people. So that kind of, you know, deters people from playing mass as a bigger person or as a curvier person or as somebody who doesn't have the, you know, size two figure. Another thing is when, when um, I'm picking my costumes, they, I go to a lot of carnivals. So me personally, I have a bigger chest. I want to wear a wire bra. I want to wear what all the size two people are wearing too, but I can't because like I said, some of these designers just don't know what exactly to do when it comes to customizing stuff for people who have a bigger chest or have a bigger body, anything like that. So I feel like a lot of designers need to cater to that aspect instead of just catering to, you know, the the ideal person that can, you know, get them a quick sale. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, something really important that you had touched on was just, like, people doing it for the money, right? And just talking about, like, how sometimes the ones that are for like curvier women or for bigger women aren't as nice. And, and I mean, if we're facing the reality, sometimes that's true. Like, I'm like, Oh, I don't want to wear like the highest panty. It doesn't look nice. It's just a plain panty, you know, but you can see that for the smaller women, you know, it's well designed, but sometimes there are like some people are really creative with, with the way that they do things, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, and that's like, you know, the people who I feel like actually care about catering to those people. 
Yeah, exactly. And I guess like just dif- being able to differentiate those things in, in in different bands or with different people and um, how they approach these ideas is something that that's really important that we need to start looking into because it's just like, you know, even when I was putting together this panel, I was just thinking like, oh, the hypersexualization of women when I after Carnival, when I go on my timeline, it's the same we don't even realize but it's the same couple women we're seeing all the time right it's Mm -hmm. not many different women that we're seeing it's probably like the same group of friends potentially but they just took a bunch of pictures and they all look different and whatever the case may be but um we're not really getting to see everything and how all of that looks you know what i mean so when i was putting this panel together i was kind of just thinking about that one idea because i guess maybe for myself that's the one idea that i see and when i feel like i i need to go to carnival that's what i think that i need to look like right and i think we all have this perception of what we need to look like even smaller women like you're saying women with bigger chests like how are they perceived when they go on the road you know what i mean and what does that look like and and we don't even think about like for well for myself and now that I'm having this conversation which I'm really happy about is when like I said when I was putting this together I didn't even think about like women with bigger chests I was just thinking like oh my gosh me like you know we need to have a flat stomach and a big bum and all these things I wasn't even thinking about all these different aspects that can come into play so mm-hmm. thank you so much for sharing that but why don't we hop over to Car- Carabella and um you guys can share kind of your thoughts on the same ideas and topics okay yeah go ahead okay Hi, everybody. I didn't get to speak for the introduction, but to connect to what Selena was saying, like in regards to like the plus size women, if you wanted to do a high waist panty, for instance, you would have to use more gems, right? Like you can't just put 15 gems on a panty and just expect that the high waist panty is going to look a specific where it's going to look like blinged out for someone who who does have a plus size, right? And like, I know a lot of the times, like when we played with other bands, it's like, okay, we're going to charge you more because you're using more material. For us, high-waist panty, you're not getting charged more. It's either you're doing a low-waist panty or a high-waist panty. So that's something that I I agree with when it comes down to building mass. Um, In regards to our section, um, we always, so we have a plus-size model. And from the beginning, when we first brought out a section, we've always had a plus-size model. Uh, Within the last three years, instead of just having like the plus size model as like an option, we had our plus size model as an, a front line so that women of bigger size can see how they're gonna look on the road, blinged out instead of how, for instance, like the ultra front line model looks with like a little wire bra and like a low cut panty. Right, right. So yeah, so like Vanessa said, we give that option, right? So we do, we do two front line options. So for, just because you're a tiny person doesn't mean that you're the only person that can play that extravagant big mass, right? So we give that option to plus size women. And in all honesty, Caribbean women, we are curvy. That's the truth. Not all of us, but a lot of us do have fuller breasts, fuller hips. We might have extra tummies. Many of us are mothers. And just because we're mothers doesn't mean that we cannot play mass. Right. So in when you were you had uh, stated the question before, you were saying, like, how do we take in the input from the older generation? Right. Mm -hmm. So with the Toronto Revelers, we have prototype showings. Right. Not just one. Not the day of the band launch. You know, you come in with your costume. We have it in January, um, February February and March. March. Right. And the panel that we showcase our costumes to, um, they comprise of young and older people, right? So sometimes um, the older generation would say, well, how can you, you know, let's say if I wanted to play in your section, how can I feel comfortable in your section, right? So the beauty of that is we're able to see all sides of of the spectrum. Um, The other thing that I wanted to mention though, was in regards to the evolution of Carnival and how our costumes have changed so drastically. So, okay, I'm going to be a little academic now because that is my area of of studies. I did my degree in Caribbean studies um, X amount of years ago. But um, the idea of feminist movements and sexual revolutions that have existed within America, within um, Canada, within uh, Britain or European countries, as much as we are a Caribbean entity, we often have a tendency of looking out to other places in the world and see what they're doing. And we tend to replicate it. 
not in a negative way at all, but when you look at the traditional mask, for instance, where there was, let's say, the baby doll character, right? And the baby doll character is dressed up in this colonial, you know, beautiful dress with a lot of material. And she's going out and she's, you know, seeing all these different men and saying, use my child father, use my child father, I'm looking for money, I want, you know? And that in itself, I mean, some people might say, well, it, it could be a little condescending. It could be a little negative that you don't know the father of your child. But in reality, that is part of our narrative. That is part of Caribbean history. Um, one of the major components, as much as we're sitting here talking about design and body and image, we also have to look at one of the major components of carnival, which is music. Music is huge. You cannot have carnival, you cannot have mass without music. Right. And when you look at the roots of carnival, it stems off to or roots are roots. It's rooted in, sorry, pan. It's rooted in Calypso. Right. And even within that evolution, Calypso goes from being male dominated, where there's only men in the Calypso tents that are singing, where you would have individuals like Calypso Rose or singing Sandra that would enter those Calypso tents and Calypso within itself evolved into soca music and ask yourself now what are the people what are the female artists singing about we have Destra I'm Lucy and Lucy right we have I remember back in my day as a child you know square one was huge and I remember that in full bloom album I don't know if you guys remember but there was that huge sunflower on that cd and Alison Hyden is saying I want a man come and ride my rhythm right um Fayan Lyon saying focus on my body focus how I sexy a contemporary song to, in 2020 was Fat by Nadia Batson. And Nadia Batson is saying, how my bumper looking? Fat, my pocket, fat, right? And she even adds that extra T onto the term fat that was once considered maybe a condescending term, but she's making it something that is celebrated. And it's a, it's a different lens that we're now using um, on the Caribbean woman. One more thing. <laughs> um, as much as we, we sit here and we talk about Caribbean women, we can't homogenize us all because we're all very different, right? Some of us come from different backgrounds, right? Um, some of us are bigger, some of us are smaller, some of us are shy, some of us are out there, right? Um, and ultimately, we have to see ourselves as a mosaic. And so when we do design our costumes, we try to bring forth that diversity and inclusion so that everyone feels like, hey, I can do it. We as Carabella, we have eight children amongst ourselves. We're mothers, right? And I remember once being told like by an older lady, like, you know, Kateri, now that you have these two kids, I think it's unacceptable and inappropriate for you to be on the road with a wire bra and a thong on, you know? And I kind of nodded my head and I was like, okay, like, thank you for your opinion, but with all due respect, when I became a mother through the act of conceiving, I was actually fully naked, right? So it's the idea of liberating ourselves um, with this sexual revolution and redefining it. Because historically, Caribbean women, primarily of Afro and Indo descent, were seen as sexual objects. And really and truly, what we see our mass as is taking that sexuality that was once stolen from us and turning it into an autonomous sexuality where we're in control and we can do as we please. And just because we wear a wire bra and a thong, um, just because we jump up and we wind up ourselves, doesn't mean that you can necessarily cross those boundaries, right? So respect is just is, is the minimum. And that's what we try to bring forth. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think it's really, I think everything that you're saying, of course, is, is extremely important. The history of it all is extremely important because that's where it stems from, right? Um, but one thing that you were saying is just like, kind of us re like owning our sexuality and some like one thing I always say and like my family will always laugh at me is like just don't sexualize the human body and they take it as a joke but it's something that's very very serious like I take it very seriously even if I pass it around as a joke sometimes because it's true sometimes we when a woman is breastfeeding or when a woman is like you said a, a, a mother wearing wearing a wire bra on the road it's 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 not sexualized. It's, it's your body it's a part of you it's who you are you know when you were conceiving you were naked so it's a part of um 
who we are and our beings and our culture and our identity. So I think just everything that you're touching on there in terms of the history and the evolution and how that's changed um, in the way that we deliver costumes. And like Selena was saying, just like things are evolving, fashion is evolving and carnival is fashion. I think sometimes people don't see it that way, right? And I think that's something that um, we're gonna tackle on when we talk about like the way that our community sees it and the way that the media sees it a little bit later on in the conversation. Um, but like you guys said, I think you guys are touching on amazing points and, point, and I think that the, the history and the touching on like the importance of fashion and identity and all these different women um, and how they approach carnival is so important. So Bianca, um, as a uh, masquerader, what is your approach to um, all these different things? And also, if you guys are able to see the comments, like feel free to like touch on those as well, because people have like some great responses to everything that you guys are saying. But Bianca, why don't you go ahead and um, talk to us a little bit about um, this experience for you? Well, for me, I'm definitely on the, the other side of it, right? I'm not designing. I'm the masquerader that comes in, and it might be because I previewed it before, and it could be the colors. It could be because the other six ladies playing with me want to play in a certain band. It's definitely um, been different every year, and especially as I got older, it changed too. And being in Toronto, very different picking a costume because of how we, we go on the road. It's um, which bands are going down first and the experience on the road, whereas in Trinidad, um, as you mentioned, Ashley, it's being in a band. I played with Tribe and I've played with Bliss. And because I've been with them for so long, every year that's who I'm playing with. So that experience you speak about of having to send a picture and get in, that's been very tough because I, I see people who have to go through that to enter the band. And that's intimidating, right? Because you have to have your body perfect. And um, I think we all are great. We talked about this earlier before we got on. Every, Especially as Caribbean women, our bodies are all different different shades, different sizes, your, your, your top could be bigger, your bottom could be bigger, whatever, we're all beautiful. And costumes before were kind of designed for one body type. Um, I know I've modeled before when I was smaller and my problem was the ties never stayed on my legs because they were so tiny. So they would fall off and I'd be like, what's wrong with me? But I would be tying them around and then they're so tight they cut off your circulation, right? Um, so again, picking costumes, I would say a few years ago was very different to now where you can go and you can see so many different designs. As Carabella says, there's the high cut panty with the same amount of gems as the little thong panty. Cause that's, that's something you would see. You know, I, I've had, my mom still plays mass. And I mean, that was something that she'd look at. She's like, well, I don't have enough beads on my panty. Like, why am I paying? You know, it's just a pay more for a different thing. Um, it's nice seeing all those different variations. And again, as, you know, if you have a bigger chest, you do need a bigger bra size. And sometimes they charge you more. The bra looks like it's not even part of the costume because it's so different. And all those things change our experience. And it does. As women, we look at it and we question, well, what's wrong with me? Why can't my costume look like that? Because you want to look like your band. You don't want to look like you went home and made something, right? So again, being on the masquerader side, um, I appreciate what these ladies are doing and how they can acknowledge the differences in bodies and understand what our psyche is as women going in when we pick a costume. It's not easy. And as like, like Nadella said, even day off, you're like, am I really going on the road with this? I mean, I wore a wire bra for the first time in 2017 with, uh, the, with Toronto Revelers and I, the, getting off to get on the road, I'm like, am I really going to do this? And it was the first year I was exposing my, um, well, I shouldn't say exposing, introducing my boys to Toronto Caravana and having them on the road with me. But yeah, it was very, it, it's tough because you know, if you wear something, people are going to look at you different. As Carabella says, you know, um, I'm a mom. I got a 17 year old 20. How am I wearing a thong and a wire bra? Like, does that make me less of a mom because I'm enjoying my culture? And then dancing, like you said, music is part of it. That is, it, it just, Soka gives you your powers, right? You get on the road, you dance. I don't see it as sexual, but I've had many conversations with people, again, who don't really embrace, I would say, the traditional Trinidad carnival. And they'll say, well, you're so sexual. You're dry reading on the road. And that's just so disgusting. I'm like, I, I don't see it like that. Um, experiences here in Toronto, very different than the Trinidad carnival because of how it's, it's security is very different. And I, funny enough, you feel safer in Trinidad carnival than you do here in Toronto carnival. Um, but I played in Cayman and I love Cayman Carnival. It's incredible. 
Um, again, being on the masquerader side, um, I have to appreciate, again, I'm going to say what these women do and how you recognize differences in our bodies because it makes it so much better when we come in to pick our, our costumes because every year we change, right? Every month we change sometimes and what we feel and what we're going through in our life is how we pick our costumes. Whether it's a big he feathered hair piece or a tiara or a thong or you need extra beads or a bigger belt to hide something or to accentuate something, we need those options, right? Oh, 100%. Even for myself, like sometimes I'm like, oh my God, should I get that collar like to hide my arms or to hide this or to hide that? And it's some things that we do so subconsciously that we don't even realize that we're doing. Yeah. And, and one thing that I want to remind us all is that the reason... and why this conversation kind of stems it's not because of the ideas of that caravan or carnival is a bad thing and we're not thinking about the other women or we're not thinking about this and that but it, it stems from that overall ideas the, of that society brings us right like what are these societal structures that we're that we're dealing with and that we're experiencing that's making us feel this way and i think that's something that's really important for us to think about is um when we like you were talking about um Kasari, is just like when we think about like colonialism and we think about these colonial structures and what that looked like and how that impacted carnival even happening, like, you know, the birth of carnival and how clo uh, col colonization had impacted that. It's kind of just like, where did those ideas come from at that time and how are they impacting us now? So we actually have someone who's putting up their hand. So I'm going to try it. I don't know if it was an accident or if she actually has a question. So I'm going to allow her to talk. Um, but her name is Karen. So Karen, if you want to go ahead, you can go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> But I don't know if she's made a mistake. So. Okay, maybe it was an accident. Um, but but um, we're going to move on to the next, um, the next topic of discussion. And I think a lot of you are going to have something that's uh, something very interesting to say about this part, just based on what you guys have been saying before. And what I want to talk about now is kind of when we look at our families and we look at our community and we look at the people around us, the people that we work with, right? Like I know you, Bianca, you said you've been working in um, the finance interest industry, right? So, um, you know, it could be a doctor, it could be a lawyer, it could be a judge. We don't know who we're winding on, but when we think about um, all these different aspects of our life and who we interact with on a daily basis, um, their response, right? And I think I had, I might have mentioned this before, but I was working, I was working in a spa, um, many years ago well not many years ago I, mean, I feel like I'm so old but it was just like two or three years ago <laughs> but anyway um, it was a few years ago and we I remember just standing there and being so excited for carnival it was caravan a weekend and I was just like so excited I was just keeping it to myself like I want to be out here I want my manager to let me out early so I can get ready and I can do what I have to do and I just remember one of the spa um, attendees she was like oh, like, I hate this weekend. I can't wait to get out of the city. Like, it's disgusting. Like, I hate seeing the women like this and that on the road. And I'm just like, oh my God, like, I can't lose my job today, but I really need to say, like, I couldn't even, I, I didn't want to be rude, but it was so hard for me to just be like, how do I even like articulate something nice to say about that, you know? Because it was so hard to see that this is actually what people see and what people perceive. And oftentimes, like the way that the reason that they perceive these things is, is not our fault. It's the way that society pushes it out. So one thing that I want to talk about here before we even jump into the media is just what are the conversations that you, you're having within your communities with, when you're at school, when you're at work, um, when you're with your kids and or when you're with your grandparents or your parents? What does that look like? And how has that um, experience impacted um, your perception on the hypersexualization of women in Carnival? Um, so I'm going to start with you, Selena. Um, just like what has your experience been um, with these different conversations and, and your approach to Carnival? Um, I, can I go next? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? We could pass it around. Anybody want to start? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Vanessa's going to actually share her experience as a midwifery assistant and what was said to her, so go ahead, Ness. So as my sister said, I do work at a midwifery clinic and I assist midwives in delivering their babies. So I always tell work like ahead of time, July is like a day, is, is a month where, you know, I'm gonna be taking a lot of days off of work. So, you know, make sure somebody can cover my shift. And I was explaining to a midwife, yeah, like I'm a section leader for caravan and we produce costumes. And I was showing her pictures of our costume and she made up her face at me and she's just like, I could never do that. Like I could never be on the road like that. And me now, I looked at her and I'm like, but we deliver babies. Like we're, our face is literally in between a woman's leg 
delivering her baby. So I don't understand why you wouldn't be able to be on the road in a panty and a bra. And this isn't the first time that it's happened, but it's like you constantly kind of have to like explain yourself on why you do it, what motivates you to do it. And like for myself and for my sister, as well as for Cicely, it's a, it's a tradition. It's a cultural thing. It's for our family. Like our dad came to Canada in 1967 and was a part of the very first caravan. Like we have a record at home that says caravan in 1967. And it was a record that was being handed out to people who attended the first caravan. And, you know, our dad had passed away three years ago and we had dedicated the section to him. It was beyond the storm. And it was like, even though he was sick, he was still sitting with us building mass. You know, and every time we cross the stage, Cicely, myself, and Kateri, we always sit here and like look up to the sky and like thank our, our dads for watching over us. Cause it's, it's not easy to have a second. It's not easy to produce. You have blood, sweat, and tears literally going into having a section. And you know, us as section leaders, like we wanna make sure that all their masqueraders feel confident, feel sexy in their costume. And I try to explain this to my coworker who's a midwife and I mean, she kind of realized after I kind of felt felt offended by what she said. And now it's like, when I see her, it's like, oh, how's Caravana stuff going? And I'm like, oops, it's going well. It's going well. So that's my experience with um, just the work environment and just trying to explain to them why we do Caravana. Um, so wanna yeah, on? sure. So I'm a little <laughs> bit... <laughs> I'm a little bit more savage than Vanessa, a little bit more outspoken in a sense. Um, so individuals that have made note about, oh my God, I can't believe you guys go on the road like that, you dance like that, and oh my God, like, oh, it's so like sexual. I always ask them the question, how do you like your tea? How do you like your coffee? Do you like it with sugar? Do you like your dessert? Do you like your ice cream? Oh, of course, everybody has a little bit of a sweet tooth and we like a little bit of sugar. Okay, cool. But if it wasn't for my ancestors, you wouldn't have sugar in your tea, now would you? Because of the idea of slavery and what the roots of carnival, what, what the roots of carnival are. So for instance, we all know that it was that celebration, that one time of the year before the lentil season for enslaved Africans to participate in not the aristocratic French carnival, but the Jamit carnival, right? And that term in its sense back in the day was seen as low class. Um, and it has evolved into, t into today. And it's a tradition that we have held on to. And it's that one time, like, I guess, moving from Trinidad to the diaspora, to Caravana in Toronto, think about it, the Caribbean community, Unfortunately, we don't necessarily have a positive light that's shone upon us 365 days of the year. A lot of the times, and we all know what's going on in the world today, we have been criminalized. Our skin color has been weaponized. And Caravana is that one time of the year when we have that positive light shone upon us. Some people will have their opinions and they might sit there and say, oh my God, it's so sexual. But my sexuality is my sexuality. My sexuality differs from Bianca's. It differs from Nadell's, from Selena's, from Ashley's, from Cindy's, and from all, from all the individuals that are watching today, right? What works for me may not work for you. What works for me might work for Selena, right? So it's important for us to... Um, to be able to see the differences and not necessarily think that we all need to fit into this little cookie cutter shape of what's considered to be acceptable feminine sexuality. Um, in regards to the community members around us, we're very lucky. You know, the older generation around us, they get it. You know, my mother used to tell me all the time, like, you're a mother, you have your sexy body, wear your, wear your, your two-piece suit because God knows how long that body's going to last. And, you know, if you can move and you can walk and whine because apparently I was whining before I could walk, you know, do, do the thing, yeah, and who cares? Like, who cares what anybody has to say? So it's, it's great for us as Carabella because it wasn't just my mom, but it was also Nana and Tahira, um, who was here in 1967, you know, who did play that mass and you know we had individuals like sis like Cicely she's not here today but her uncle uncle 50 you know that was a male that pushed 
the females around him to play a mask, to build a mask, to take the time to be in the mask camp. And like Vanessa said, put your blood, sweat, and tears. Have your children sleeping on futons, you know, running around. The place is hot because the mask camp is not air conditioned, right? And we still do it because we love it and we love our culture and we love our Caribbean counterparts. And really why we do it and the message out there, it's celebration. It's that time for us to be free. It's that time for us to showcase our emancipation. And once again, break the barriers that society has created for us. So that's Carabella's response. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it was a really powerful response. Honestly, when you were talking about it, I was feeling like choked up, you know? I think, I think it's really true, like how, how passionate that we are about the culture and about, being, uh, and about being a part of it, right? And then sometimes when we see people having negative things to say or like well my mom told me something else like my mom asked me when I was going out why I was wearing so much clothes right like why I wasn't celebrating my body right so it's all these different things that we're kind of battling with it when we go to the outside world and a couple of people were saying it in the um I'm gonna read a comment here it was pretty funny let me see if I can find it they're having like really good conversations in the in the chat so um Renee she said I feel like people don't have to understand us, but they must respect us. There's always an issue with us as women playing mass. However, in the gay pride parade, there are men naked swinging there totally, but the conversation <laughs> is, never, is never getting the steam. And something that I have written down is sometimes um, women of color, this is something that we experience all the time is we're, we're exoticized, right? We're like fetishized. Like we're seen as like these like creatures, you know what I mean? Um, to the outside world. And when we think about things like bells, when we think about when we think about when um, Dr. J's party, I'm assuming that everybody is from Toronto is or is aware of Dr. J. I'm sure, um, but when he had the party um, in the in the West End near Vaughan, and his party got shut down, and then there was another was it Veld or something? I don't remember what was happening like a bit down the road. It didn't get shut down, and it was a party. It was a party with less people of color, you could say. Um, but when we look at these things, when we look at all these other different celebrations that are happening around the world they're not seen the same way that Caravan or Carnival is seen and they're not um, criticized in the same way. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so just, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to, to just, just based off of what you just said, where there's this gay parade, it's fine. They're gonna shut down Dr. J's FET. Um, they're gonna, what is it called, FELT? VELD. VELD, oh, okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, so VELD is, it can keep going. I, the thing about it, and one thing, like I said, we cannot be homogenized, but one of the things that I, I can say that we can agree upon is Caribbean people are resilient. Mm -hmm. People of color are resilient. And unfortunately, there's gonna always be this magnification that's gonna be placed upon our community just because we are who we are. We could give them a thousand and one reasons as to why the party shouldn't be shut down, as to why we jump up and play a mass down the lake shore. We can give it to them, but for some reason, it goes to deaf ears, right? But the beautiful thing about us is it doesn't matter. We keep pushing, we keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Exactly like when you go to a fete and the music shuts off and people yeah. start to pick up the bottle and a spoon and we start to play and sing the songs, we have that continuity attached to us. And the beautiful thing is, it's within our DNA. We were people who come from struggle. Doesn't matter what socioeconomic background you come from, we, we come from struggle. We, our history is very tragic. The region itself was based off of slaver, slavery, off of indentured ship, off of the objectification of female sexuality. And guess what? We, the descendants of those individuals who were beaten and raped and brutalized, we're still standing today. And we're still pushing that cause. We're still pushing that tradition. So when Selena, you produce a costume all throughout, you know, 365 days of the year, and you keep pushing and you keep pushing, she's, she has that mentality, right? She has that skills that may have been passed on to her from her father, her mother, and whoever. But guess what? That resiliency is within her DNA, right? And that's something that a lot of us need to sit back and think of and say, wow, we really, we really come from powerful people. We really come from powerful women, from powerful men. And guess what? No matter what, we're still standing. 
<laughs> like, sorry ours is like a little delayed so i was like i think i think that's why um we had a short little pause um, oh, okay but why don't we who wants to take the stage i don't know if anybody has actually any- i'm gonna say like i mean i grew up in trinidad and i mean playing carnival was part of your, your school curriculum we made our costumes because we had our mass in school before we shut down for carnival. So that was the best. It was the best. So here's your whole classroom, your whole school, we're all competing against each other. So the love we have from mass growing up in Trinidad, and I'm very fortunate that I had parents that played mass and loved, I mean, they're Trinidadian, they love their culture. And I went to go with them when they were picking up their costumes and get to see that, but grew up with a love for dance, the love for music, the love for, you know, throwing all the glitter on your paper headpiece because that's what we're making. But it was so great. My first Caravana I experienced was 1983. Very, very different. Because, you know, it was University Avenue. Um, looked nothing like a Trinidad Carnival. And they didn't even have Juve back then, right? Um, There's no Jab Jab running on the road. Like, it was very different. But, again, it was Canada. So you, you expected it to be different. Um, as I got older and I was working, as we... No, I'm in the finance industry, always been my career. Um, I was ashamed. I was because they looked at it as such a bad thing. I would never talk about playing mass. I never told anybody the reason I took that entire week off before Caravana is because as a Trinidadian woman, I'm part of, the, I'm part of it. I have to go to every fet. I can't come to work if I'm on a boat cruise Wednesday night. Like I, I never said anything. I took a week off. Um, and I'll never forget, I was working, um, it was my second um, move in my career. Um, I was in, in a higher position, leadership position, never told anybody. I came into work and there was a picture on my desk. It was the front page of the Toronto Sun and I was on it. And somebody said it was me. I'm like, no, that's not me. I spent the entire day trying to deny that wasn't me standing on top of a truck in a costume. I'm like, no, it's not me. Cause I thought it was going to get fired. I thought they would be like, how are you doing this? And it was such an embarrassing thing. My parents still have the paper because they hold on to it. And I think my kids probably have a copy in their keepsake box, but I was truly like, it was, it wasn't something that you would share because they looked at it as negative. There's violence. There was fights. There was a stabbing. There was a shooting. They never saw the beauty of playing mass. Um, I will say in 2008, that changed. And now I embrace it and I talk about it and I'm very involved and yes I'm a Trinidadian woman I enjoy carnival it's not disgusting that we dance in the road sorry it's not sexual because we're whining with people doesn't mean we're trying to have as people say sex with people no it's not and because I'm wearing a thong and a wire bra doesn't make me less of a woman or a mother or professional because I'm embracing my culture I couldn't have those conversations before 2008 because I didn't know how to, and I didn't feel empowered to say something. Now I'll have the best conversations with you. I'm wearing what I want. And I I like my culture. I have a quick question for you. Um, Just talking about the the paper. I think that's something really interesting. Um, Also, it's it's very funny, but also I'm sure in the situation, it was very nerve wracking and very upsetting and and very scary. to. It's funny now. I can laugh about it now, but back then I cried. (laughs) I literally went in my car and cried. Yeah, I could, I could only imagine how you're feeling because it's, it's something hard to deal with, right? Especially being a woman of color, advancing in your career and doing something, you know, a lot of women don't see us doing sometimes, right? So, well, now much more than before, for sure. Um, so I guess what was the response from the people at your job when they did see this paper? Because almost like when you come into your job and you see that, that newspaper on your desk, it's almost like a threat, right? It's almost like they're trying to threaten well, you. Well, that's how I, I, I thought I was in trouble. I thought, oh my goodness, they, it's like, you know, getting caught stealing a cookie out of the cupboard at home when you weren't allowed to. Um, I was scared. I will say um, the directors at the time, there were four male directors. They were very good about it. Um, From a male perspective, I think they saw it. But there were a lot of women in the office that were like, I can't believe you did that. Like, I didn't know you did that. I didn't know you were like that. Those were the kind of comments. And that made me, it, it, it was like you were ashamed of something that was such a great day. And where I, my family was like, oh my goodness, get every copy of this paper. And they're so happy about it. I'm at work feeling embarrassed and I hope nobody else finds out and more people don't talk to me. And it, like I said, it was not a good feeling where I shouldn't be hiding my culture. I should be proud to say, this is what it is. 
and not because you only see a couple of highlights on TV, on our city news back then, and you see the ugliness of it, right? The storming of fences and you see, you know, you hear about a stabbing or something that went wrong or parties the week before that something happened. That's not what carnival is about, right? But like I said, back then, I, I wasn't, I didn't empower myself enough to have those conversations. I wasn't a savage back then. I definitely have more savage now that I could have those conversations. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I, I think it's, again, super, super important what you're talking about. When we think about women in business, obviously, like with Brown Girl Dara, we have um, a whole section where we just talk about like Indo-Caribbean women in business and just um, supporting a lot of different organizations that focus on women in business that are Caribbean and are of color, of course. So um, thank you for touching on that. I think it's super important. Just deal I'm glad that that came up, actually, just like how people deal with that in the workplace, just because that was something that not as intense, but something that I had dealt with when I was working in Unionville at the spa and people had so many negative things to say. And just like you said, like you take that week off and, and you're going to all these facts and you're not saying why, but, um, or you're not saying why you're missing work, but it's just to enjoy the culture and to celebrate. And you're willing to do that because it's just that one time of the year where you can just be proud of who you are and be proud of your culture. So again, super, super important, but why don't we jump over to, um, Nadell and you can go ahead and, and talk about your experience with this as well. Sure. So I was, after listening to Kateri and Bianca, I'm like, do I answer the question? Do I respond to Kateri? Do I respond to Bianca? But no, I completely, I can really resonate with what you said, Bianca, because I also was very hesitant about letting my professional side see uh, that I was involved in Carnival. And um, I guess once I started the brand and I knew that I was becoming an advocate for people that I couldn't hide anymore. And I didn't even realize I felt after a while, I felt like, was I ashamed of my culture? Like, why was I, why did I feel like I couldn't? And like you said, it's what people see in the media and they see the ugliness. They don't know. And I think what I've learned is that this was an opportunity for me to educate people that don't know about the culture. They don't know about the labor of love that Kateri spoke about where you see people in the mass camp overnight and people like Selena that are creating costumes throughout the year. And it's not just one day, it's not a street party, it's an actual competition. We're actually portraying creativity. There's, there's a history and a tradition behind it. And, you know, Kateri even talking about you know, all the characters and it's, there's so much that Carnival, th there's so much to it that people don't know. And I think that was the one thing that I've taken from starting this movement is telling people about it and having those safe conversations and letting them know more so that then they're not coming from such a closed lens. So I think um, just, touching on that point, right? Like having these conversations. Um, what did these conversations for you kind of like look like when you were having conversations with people in your workplace or even at home or even like, you know, within your community? What did these conversations look like and how did you kind of navigate those conversations? So like, like Kateri says, you know, sometimes people seem like they're really ex accepted and, you know, it's great and it's fun. But then sometimes I've heard, like, you know, slight comments because I used to travel a lot pre-pandemic. And um, when I would be yeah, going you're at every carnival. <laughs> no. I, <laughs> and, um, you know, one time one of my coworkers said, you know, um, you're going to that hookup party that you go to or that hookup festival. And I was taken aback so much. I didn't know, like, First of all, like why they felt that that was something that they would even be able to say to me um, in the workplace. And I had to let her know, like, no, that's never been anything that I've been going to carnivals to do. And, um, <laughs> you know, I think sometimes you have to have that hard conversation. So um, after a while, I had to tell her, like, yeah, it is a competition. And actually, that was the conversation that I was thinking about when I was talking about, you know, what you have to tell them. And I broke things down for her and I think she understood more. I don't know if she was just saying that. So I was talking, but um, yeah, you know, sometimes people will say to your face, yeah, they, they agree with it or they, they're accepting or they're a part of it, but there's a little bit of bias or, um, you know, things that they're not going to share with you, but think in the back of their mind. 
Yeah, and just to touch on that a little bit um, before I, I just open the floor, um, I just remember, like, a lot of times, like, a lot of my friends were just like, oh, like, you would, like, you and your boyfriend are going to go to carnival? Like, that's so weird. You guys let each other dance on other people? That's, like, so disgusting. Like, oh, my God. Like, you know, just all those negative comments where they're like, why do you guys dance with other people? Like, isn't it weird? Don't you guys just want to be, like, attached to each other at the hip pretty much? And I'm like, well, no, like, I trust him. And it's a part of our culture. Like, it's something that we met each other in a fet, like, soak or die. So, you know, we're diehard Soka fans. But, like, it's it's kind of, like, how do how do other people kind of see it in terms of like even with our relationships and and when we're navigating our relationships and why people see it that way and why people see it as something so bad again when it's just our culture and it's something that we've kind of grown up in it's something that we adapted to where like our all our families dancing together everybody's dancing together and from the outside looking in like we said it, it might look weird to other people but to us it's such a norm but like but touching back on to like all these different celebrations that happen um, things like Bell, things like Digital Dreams, things like, I think someone had said even St. Patrick's Day and the Gay Pride Parade, like they're able to do it in these situations, but when it comes to people of color and that approach, it's much, much different. So I just wanted to make that um, slight comment about that and, and my experience with it. But uh, I don't know, did anybody else have anything to say in regards to this? I know, um, Selena, I don't know if you touched on it as yet and if you wanted to touch on it, uh, what your experience has been like having these conversations uh, with people in your community and what that's looked like and how it's been for you? I think in respect to that, it'll always be hard in Canada to change people's perspective on carnival as a whole. Only because you have places like Brazil who have carnivals. That's their culture. They know that as their culture. You have Trinidad. They know that as their culture. Whereas Canada is like a melting pot. We have people from all different places, it's hard to educate everybody on what carnival means. So you'll have people having their respective opinions on something that they don't really know about. So um, another thing that I wanted to say is I think a lot of people come up with their assumptions and their ideas based off of age. A lot of people, I've heard a lot of comments about kiddies carnival, well, how do you have your kid in this so early? Why would you put them in this so early? Me personally, I've been doing this for so long. I was in a wire brow when I was 16. I know my mom has gotten numerous comments. How do you have her in this costume on stage, wearing this, she's wearing half to nothing. My mom, like us as Caribbean people, that's what we know. Um, I personally have had a lot of, my Instagram is almost next to just bathing suits bathing suits and carnival costumes. I've had a lot of times where I've had people ask me, well, do you wear clothes? Do you ever wear clothes? And it's like, you know, like, like I shouldn't have to feel like me wearing a carnival costume is me not wearing clothes or me being, you know, overly exposed. And I know a lot of it is from, like I, someone said, I can't remember who said it, but as Caribbean people, we're curvier. If someone with a flat were to wear what I'm wearing on my Instagram, I know they wouldn't get no hassle about it. But because I have a bigger chest, it's over sexualized. Um, so I just, it's hard to change people's perspective in Canada just because we have so many people from so many different places. But I mean, as Caribbean people and as, you know, women in the industry and designers, it is our job to educate them. It's hard, but, you know. So someone in the comments actually um, said, Someone accused me of sexualizing my daughter, but not my son, who her son was shirtless on, um, like, I, I'm assuming during carnival, during Kitty's carnival. Um, so she said, someone accused me of sexualizing my daughter, but not my son who was shirtless. And then she kissed her teeth. So uh, yeah, so she said Kitty. So, um, well, and then someone also said the slut shaming for Caribbean women is real. Um, and 100%. And that's something I definitely want to touch on when we hop into our next section. But I just want to know if anybody um, had any other like last comments for this topic um, before we move on to our next section, our final section? No, nope, everyone good. I actually have. Oh, no, Selena. We... Yeah, go ahead, Bianca. No, oh. oh, as Selena was saying, we have to to educate people. But sometimes, we, even within our own communities, we still have to educate people um, because they they don't fully understand it. They still see some of the dancing, like you said, dancing with other people as a sexual thing. Are you trying to hook up with that person? No, you're not, right? 
Like, um, I don't even know who they are. I forgot about them. Like, you know? Yeah, like, uh, my rule was always, and I mean, people laugh at this, I have a three-second rule. Three-second wine and you're out. I'm not trying to know your name. I'm not trying to know where you work. I'm not trying to know anything. And again, I am a mom. I, I was married for 21 years. Um, and even my, I, my ex-husband, he would, he is, he's not dead. So I should say he is Guyanese. <laughs> and he had to learn the culture because it wasn't something he knew of. Yeah right? Carnival in Guyana was non-existent. I mean, I know they're doing it now, but he learned to play mass and he learned to accept the culture and, and really enjoy it. I think he was enjoying it because he played mass and did all the fets. And I mean, for 21 years, he seemed to enjoy it. And then, I mean, my boys grew up, you would, they and totally loved their Trinidadian culture. Um, but I know even within some of our own communities, because it could be religious background, it could be they weren't exposed to it in the same way. It could be that they saw it from a sexual point because they did it as a teenager or as a young adult. And it was about going on the road and winding on a woman and picking her up and hooking up. And that's not what it is. So, um, I, I, you know, Ashley, I wear my heart on my sleeve. So I'm going to be my, I've had, um, my last relationship was with a, uh, a Jamaican man and he had a really hard time with carnival and me playing mass, but he could sit in the front row of a band launch and enjoy other women watching, but had a hard time with me as, as his partner playing mass and being in mass and being on the road, because that's sexual. But I'm like, what's the difference of watching it versus being in it? Because you're not doing anything, right? It's not about that. Oh, you're half naked and you're dancing. Well, well that's, what, that's carnival. Right. And you don't look at it as half, half naked. It's our costume. It's our feathers. It's, it's, it's a beauty of, I love a big costume because when I'm dancing, I, I, that feathers all over the wind. Sometimes I'm going to blow away, but I love it. Absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. And for me, it just, I, I mean, you see the smile on my face. It, it's very different what carnival means to me. Right. It's not about just gyrating in the road. And when people say that, I, I take offense to that. That's not what it is. Right. Yeah, 100%. And I think that um, sometimes it, it's so beautiful and, and it's such a freeing feeling that it, it's hard to put into words, right? And it's, it, it really is hard to put into words. And I can feel that when you guys talk about it, sometimes you're just like, it's just so amazing. I can't even describe it. I can't even fathom how people don't enjoy this and don't have fun with it. And oftentimes, a lot of the people that have a lot to say, when they do experience it and they do feel it, they're like, wow, why wasn't I doing this before, right? So um, yeah, just did anybody, <laughs> did you want to say <laughs> Just put your hand whenever you want to talk. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I pretty much just wanted to touch upon a few things. So one thing uh, that Selena had said um, in regards to kitties. I have two kids, um, Zion and Kyrie. Kyrie's first mask was at two months. Two months. Two months. Yes, two months. He crossed the stage at two months old. Uh, Zion has been modeling um, for kitties for, since he was two years old. Um, Renee, I was reading through the comments, had said something about, but you can bring your child to the beach, right? And you can put your child in a, in a, in a bathing suit and no one's saying anything. But when we put our children in, um, in carnival costumes, it's looked upon in a negative light, right? And once again, it just goes back to my initial point where being from the Caribbean community, there's always this magnification upon us where we have to fit this, this little cookie cutter shape or whatever, you know, for us to be considered acceptable. Um, and if we don't fit into that cookie cutter little shape, we're unacceptable. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say was when Selena was talking about Toronto, and this is such a diverse city, right? And there is so much multiculturalism in this city. Um, Carabana makes is one of the largest economic generators for the city of Toronto. Yep. Lest we forget. Right? So you would think <laughs> that they could maybe include some sort of Caribbean history or black history, um, Afro-Canadian history, black Canadian history, Caribbean ca Canadian history in the curriculum that our kids are studying because at the end of the day, it's a crucial component of what Toronto is. You go to Pearson International, guess who you see? You're gonna see somebody in a costume. It's up there when you're, when you're, enter, when you're uh, arriving to, to Toronto, you're gonna see someone in a carnival costume. Um, 
because ultimately that's part of the Canadian or the Torontonian narrative and we can't ignore that, right? So um, to Bianca's point, I don't do three seconds, I do one song. <laughs> <laughs> a verse and a chorus. Yeah. One and song. After that, after that, it's like, okay, okay, all right, all right, all right. But if the <laughs> wine is sweet, I might do two, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 100%. Um, I definitely agree with that. But so I have a question here. Um, and it's for you to anybody that wants to answer the question. But Renee is asking, um, Renee coming up with a lot of good points um, in the chat. Um, do you think women would play mass if they felt that they that they felt if they felt there wouldn't be any backlash from their workplace? Yes, I think so. Hundred percent. I think a lot more women would play if they weren't worried about the pictures, the videos, because I mean, Carnival's very public. You can't control who's taking a picture of you. You cannot. Anybody who says, oh, I'll hide from the camera, please don't try to hide from a camera. Someone's gonna catch you. So I think, yes, if it wasn't that shaming of playing mass, um, I think a lot more women would get involved in it. Yeah, 100%. Um, thank you, Renee, for that question. And if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to ask it and I'll try my best to get to it um, throughout, the throughout the conversation. So um, this part I'm very excited about. I know we touched on it a little bit, um, but the reason that I wanted to talk about this, obviously, is because something that um, stayed stayed with me for a long time is when we seen that Joe Budden podcast and he started talking about, I think it might have been Maya or he might have, it might have been Chili. I can't remember what he said, but um, he got a lot of backlash for it where he started talking about them as sluts. And I can't remember his exact words, but I just remember that he had said something negative about Carnival. Um, and a lot, yeah, someone's like, oh, Joe. But yeah, he had said something really negative about it and everybody was kind of like, okay, like, you know, a lot of women in Carnival were like, this is not okay what he's saying. He's slut shaming us. He's sexualizing us. He's making us look like sluts and whores and whatever the word may be. But um, that's what kind of stemmed um, my interest in having this conversation. When we look at what Carnival looks like in the media, we talked about it again, when we look at like the economy and how it impacts the economy. So it's also how they... Um, how, like the delivery of how they portrayed in certain ways. Um, just what has your experience been with seeing um, Carnival in the media? And when I say media, I'm talking about um, our kind of uncontrolled media, but also our controlled media when we see it on CP24, but also when we see it through Joe's podcast and when we see it through um, social media, when we see it online, when we see it um, promoted in different newspapers or wherever, the, wherever we may see it, right? And however it's interpreted in these mainstream platforms, uh, what has your approach been to that? And what is your response to things that we see? And kind of what do you think could be done better? But what do you also think is being done well? So I think we sometimes we think about the negative when we think about the media, but what are some things that you also think are being done well for Carnival in the media? Because I think that's a big part of it as well. And it is growing, like it's becoming very, very big. We see people like Mashal and all these different artists, uh, Shensia, she's dance hall, but she does a few soca songs. But, you know, we see them in mainstream media and having opportunities with um, bigger artists in, in different industries. So I think there is a lot of positivity, but um, also there could be a lot of negative, negativity with it as well. So why don't we touch on a few of those things? Um, does anybody want to take the lead first? I'm going to yeah. jump in first. Yeah, because we've got these three talented designers that we have online here. And I feel that's stuff that needs to get showcased more. It, like, they, we don't get to see them sweating and trying to figure out a design and trying to get 20 beads on when you could only fit five. And you're like, this was the design. How do we figure it out? We need to see more footage of that creativity and the blood, sweat, tears, the late nights, the pulling your hair out and doing everything you can to make our costumes look the best when we're on the road because it's a competition and I think people forget about that right um and we don't get to see any of that all we see on the media is a few clips that you see down the road where it's a crowd of people you see some music and they focus on on you know a few people as they say quote unquote gyrating and that's it that's what we see carnival in Toronto as so I think some more focus on the the back end and what makes Carnival Carnival would be great for people to see because they don't see that. And knowing as Carabella has focused on the history of what Carnival is 
Yeah, just to touch on that um, real quick, um, if you guys haven't been on the Brown Girl Diary page at the BG Diaries, we did do a couple covers with a couple of mass fans um, talking about their experience and their history and their love for um, why they do what they do. So make sure you guys check that part out because, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying our best to do it. And I've noted it down right here. So when we start doing some more work and Carnival comes back, we can make sure we see the background and we see the blood, sweat, and tears from you guys. So why don't I get Nadell? We didn't hear from you in a long time. Why don't we get you to jump in and talk about this? Because you've done like a lot of like, you've done a lot of media stuff, right? Like with the, with the um, Toronto media and stuff like that. So why don't you talk about your experience with that and what that's looked like? So I was actually going to say about the same thing you said, Bianca. Um, in Toronto, the media shows Carnival as more of a street party. And I think that's uh, one of the flaws why we have a lot of stormers. People do not understand that the process of registering, the process of getting involved. And I think that's what um, why we need to have a lot more like you said, a lot more programs on how you register. And a lot of the education sh like pieces that are out there are targeted to people in the community who already know. How do we get to the younger generation that are now just want to go down to Caravana because they think it's, or Toronto Carnival because they think it's fun and they don't have the right message or they don't have the understanding of the competition, of the hard work that goes in. Um, and I do think, so my experience being the 2019 face of Carnival last year, and a lot of the questions I was asked was around why I was doing it, or um, pretty much like more body positive, um, like questions. And I think that's also an important aspect of getting more people to participate and register. But I do think like Terry said, getting uh, courses or something in the history books and lessons, I think we need to do a lot better of getting our culture um, known and not within our community. I think it needs to be like, I, I don't know, I think it's hard to know how we can get something like this done in Toronto because it is a problem and I just don't know what our solutions could be. And, and I think just to touch on that um, really quickly, Nadell, and we had had a quick conversation about this yesterday, but even platforms like Everybody Play a Mass and like utilizing that to really um, shed lots of different information or just using our social media, I, I genuinely believe it's such a powerful tool um, that we can share a lot. Like even with Brown Girl Diary, when we share certain things, I'm surprised at how much people care, how many people care about their culture and how many people care about their history. People are like, People are looking for it and people are, are yearning for it. But I think that people, sometimes they just don't have the spaces to find it. And I think just like creating spaces like Everybody Play a Mass and, and spaces like, you know, Brown Girl Diary and, and other, like, you know, there's so many different collectives happening right now for Caribbean people where we need to take advantage of and just really bring that to the forefront, right? So I don't know if um, Katari um, or, and Carabella, if you guys want to um, touch on that. I don't know if I should call you guys by your, your individual names or if I should address you guys as like an entity. So I was just like throwing out whatever came You can say Carabella, it's yeah. fine. I know, I love it, it's so cute. It just <laughs> rolls off the tongue, so. Right, so just basically in regards to what Nadal was saying about um, the education and providing knowledge mm -hmm. to those that are part of the community, those that are not part of the community, but to help them understand our culture a lot better. We, one of the things we need to realize is we can't shove it down anyone's throat. Because if we were to do that, they're just going to be like, ah, I don't want to do this. We have to be creative with how we put it out there, right? We have to... I mean, we could talk about our experience with, like, the sponsorship, like Joe Fresh. Okay, go ahead. So, yeah. um, we had a sponsorship last year from a union, which was an electrician union. And, like, we had to present to them why they should sponsor us and, like, there was, n like, everybody who was at that particular uh, presentation, except for Carabella, they were non-Caribbean uh, individuals. So we had to explain, like, we were explaining to them, like, the process that we take. Like, a lot of people think that Carabana is just the grand parade, when it's not. Like, there's so much more to Carabana than that. There is, you know, choosing your colors, literally, maybe the Monday after Carabana finishes, 
you know, coming up with sketches, uh, waiting for your band to release what the theme is, thinking of names for your section, thinking of designs, thinking about how you're going to portray or make sure that your section's name portrays the theme and it portrays the design that you're going to put forth. There is being at the pan yard, there is, you know, the band launch. Like we finished our costumes way before March, April, May. Like our costumes are in the molds literally a week before or a week after Caravan is done. So we had to explain to the union like what goes in to being a section leader, what goes into being a part of a, a mass camp. And a lot of like the people who were there were like, I didn't even know that when we did. Okay, so one of the things like I, I think relatability like even with just basic human relations, when you are able to relate to another person, there's this comfort level that suddenly arises, right? And because this, it was an electrical union, um, I simply asked the question, how many of you guys have the ability to weld? How many of you guys know how to weld? I do, I do, I do, okay. That's great because welding is an integral component to mass. It's a dying art, but it's an integral component. And if you guys would like to volunteer, because really that's what we were looking for, but we were also looking for a sponsorship, sponsorship yeah. right? You guys can come to the mass and don't feel like you can't contribute. Your skill, which is a dying art within our community, unfortunately, because I got to hail up Uncle Noel and some of you guys, you know, might know Uncle Noel. He would be in, you know, Uncle Chris there in Saldina and Uncle Noel is there with his little Desperados flag, you know, on the corner and his, tr and his little Trindago flag on the next and he playing Desperados and he's, you know, putting the wiring together, you know, you know, on his own quietly to himself. But how many young people are doing that? Not many. Right, so we try to be able to bridge this gap where although they're not of West Indian descent, they could still partake in the celebration, right? Um, and there's Joe Fresh. Joe Fresh, yeah. They're right beside Lamport Stadium where their headquarters is and they didn't even know that they had King and Queen on Thursdays. On the Thursday before Caravana, they were like, well, we normally just take half day off and just leave. Like they've never been there and it's literally a two second walk to Lamport Stadium. So it's just being able to educate others in regards to what we do and just letting them know, like it's not just what you see on the road. There's so much more that happens behind the scene that should be acknowledged. And the other thing too that I wanna mention that a lot of people feel to realize, but like Nadell said, it's not a street party, right? One of the things that I always say is no costume, no wine. Sorry, if you're a stormer, don't come behind me. I don't care how your waistline winds about back and forth. It's not going down. Not I, even for a second. Not <laughs> even for a split second. Not at all, right? And I know a wine is just a wine, but not on the road today, honey. Not on the road. No costume, no wine. I no agree. costume, no wine. But yep. one of the things that needs to be noted, right, despite the amount of hours that we put into the mass camp, because our babies are in the mass camp, you know, we're away from our partners. We're away from, we have smaller children. We're away from the smaller kids because you're not going to have a two-year-old running around in the mass camp because there's so many different things that they can get into that could, sorry, excuse me, that could potentially be harmful to them, right? But the older ones, they're sleeping on the futons. It's hot, you know, it's dusty. You know, when you're trying to design your piece and you're dashing the bra and panty against the wall, you're crying in a corner asking, yourself what is really life about you know but we still continue to push through my mate my point is caravana is a competition and a lot of people forget that and that competition it's not just about the monetary prize but it's also about the pride that's attached to being the band of the year right and um like Vanessa said we put in a lot it's not just the time it's not just the money it's the energy we all, I'm pretty sure the majority of us all work full-time jobs. We have our families that we have to take care of, but we still find a way to get into the mass camp and do what we have to do. We have to, we have a business, right? If there is a business, yes, and we have to fulfill our business orders, but we also have to stay true to our tradition, right? So it's a dedication. It's not easy, but we do it for our culture. And when you see those stormers come in, it is absolutely heartbreaking. It's upsetting because it's like, man, oh man, you have no idea how much we had to put in to create this year's festivities. Um, 
so like Vanessa said, and I think we all can agree, it's really about the education. The question is how? Because not everybody is the same, they learn the same, not everybody's gonna take it in all the same, right? So we have to be creative with it, you know? Oh, yeah, Vanessa made a good yeah. point. With Carabella, we also provide high school, like, you know, the, community, uh, hours. the community hours that you have to uh, complete in order for you to graduate come on in we're going to provide you those hours we're going to teach you about the art of mass we're going to teach you how to you know there's an art to gemming that gem onto that bra with that glue gun and yes you're going to get burnt so you can sign a disclosure right but you are going to get burnt and it does hurt and when you get burnt don't pull it off right away you have to let it dry because if you don't you're going to pull off your skin with it right so with the young people we try to make it fun and have them come in and not just have it as a community service task, but hey, you're partaking in the community and it's part of our culture. And even if it's not part of your culture, hey, at the end, you contributed to something beautiful and remarkable. And yeah, and we say, th and we say yeah. thank you, right? So. Yeah, just to touch on um, something that you had said um, in terms of King and Queen, and you were saying how, uh, I think it was Joe Fresh, they didn't know that Lamport Stadium was right there and King and Queen happens right there. Um, just touching back on to the idea of like women and hypersexualization and, and, and the reason for this conversation, there was a lot of, uh, that's a lot of times why people don't realize that there's other things that go on, right? Like even for us, sometimes we don't even realize like the um, importance of these events and, and these things that are happening behind the scenes. And it's not just the feds, right? On our end, it's not just the feds. There's also all these things that are happening, even and I want to get, I want to touch, um, like jump to Selena for this, because obviously you've participated in so many King and Queens since I don't even know what age, but you had talked about this with, um, when you did our feature for Brown Girl Diary and you talked about how people don't even realize like all the, like, again, blood, sweat and tears that goes into making your costume and, and the art that's behind it and the choreography behind it. And, and, you know, the, um, hydraulics on your costume and all these different things that you talked about that were so important and sometimes we don't even realize because we're so focused on the sexuality that come that is um given to us when we see carabana we see carnival so why don't you talk a little bit about that and and how king and queen um is portrayed in the media or just how it is impacted because of the way that carabana is seen and carnival is seen well in the media i've never personally seen anything you know misconstrued about king and queen king and queen is king and queen um on road is a different story a lot of people think that caravan is just the road parade but no it's king and queen it's kitties it's pan just like carabella said um on road you'll have people you know the stormers the masquerades, the people who are playing masks but don't really know the background behind it you know they'll bump into a big mask and say you know like it's just there no, it's not just there. It's, you know, people put months, nights, long hours into making something that's, you know, visually appealing, that's part of the culture, that's, you know, it has to be there for the culture. That's what it's there for. It's not just there to be there and look pretty. Um, another thing I'll say is that the sponsorship thing, I'm glad that Carabella brought that up because I would love to see, I would say as a, a carnival, business and as a carnival band it's probably one of the hardest industries to get sponsored in in canada um and i would love to see all these brands and i actually my my band per se we've been reaching out to a lot of people now even though it's a pandemic um they're saying that caravan is going to be back on next year we've been reaching out to all these brands that are preaching you know black lives matter we want to support black lives we want to do this and that for the black community give us a sponsorship opportunity why do we have to push 10 times harder than a you know a bell there are st pat's there santa claus parade why do we have to push that much harder to for you to invest in us um another thing is within the media you have just like carnival is is you know evolutionizing um social media is huge instagram is huge that's a lot of most of the time that's the only time you see how people promote their, their brands and their bands. In Trinidad, you will see a band pick an Instagram influencer over somebody who knows about the culture, who can model your costume, express to people, you know, I know the culture. I'm modeling it and I know the culture. You'll have people pick followers over that because, you know, it's a quick sale. It's bringing people to your brand. It's bringing people 
I have a lot of people behind the scenes forgetting about the culture just for you know the quick sale and the quick dollar um which is also losing like the education in the culture you can't have an instagram influence who's just modeling a costume and doesn't know anything about the culture to educate anybody you could take the whole Nicki minaj and her husband incident with iowa as an example why are you on the truck and you had the ability to push iowa if it was a regular, regular person who knew about the culture and was on the truck, you know how quick they would get kicked off that truck? But no, because it's Nicki Minaj and because it's her man, it was a slide. It wasn't a slide in the curvy community, but on that day it was a slide. So you have these influencers who also need to educate themselves if they want to participate in our culture. Not saying they can't, not saying they have to know every single detail about the culture, but at least know a little background. Yeah, 100%. And I think that was a really good point. I forgot about that Nicki Minaj thing. And, and that was a really big thing in the community. And people were so upset about it. And, and it's a really good point. Like, why are these people that don't even know about the culture being able to be on the trucks and this and that? And one thing that we, um, like, I'm sure you had heard when you were in Trinidad or, or even up here is like, a lot of times, like things like King and Queen and things like Soka Monarch and things like Chutney Soka Monarch, all these things are right now dying out because people are not participating in it and i know that's like a big thing in trinidad um i heard a lot of conversations about it when i was over there like people are not participating people don't want to be a part of it they're giving out tickets for free like i was on the avenue and people were literally just like here please take this ticket just come we don't want you to pay the money the tickets however much but just come because we don't want you to pay for it we just want people to be there and keep it going so um when i was touching on kind of like the way that um carnival is seen in the media and and how people perceive it is really impacting the big cultural aspects that are attached to it. Like I said, like Chutney Soka Monarch, like King and Queen and, and like Soka Monarch and all these different things that come with it. And like um, Panorama and all these things, or sorry, Pandemonium, um, all these different things that are happening, right? So uh, I don't know if anybody wants to touch on that. Those are some of the thoughts that I had and, and what I experienced when I was in Trinidad and what I hear and what I see. Um, and, and something that's really upsetting because um, when you have these conversations with, with people like you that are building the costumes and building the masks and saying that it's hard to get sponsorships and it's hard to get this and it's hard to get that, but then you look at something, and I'm using belt grants because it's the same weekend and, and a lot of comparisons are made between the two. You see things like, I don't even know what they're sponsored by, probably Google, MasterCard, Visa, this, that, right? Exactly. And um sometimes we're just sponsored by Scotiabank and it, it's like a hassle to even get them to be on our side and understanding what we go through. Again, I'm not really on the back end, so it's just what I see from the outside looking in. Um, but if anybody wants to touch on a little bit more of the media and, and that experience, um, you can go right ahead. But, uh, but the, Ashley, I think we're all saying the same thing. Like it yeah, goes back to people understanding, we got to educate them on the history of Carnival. Um, they have to respect the culture and they have to understand the art that goes behind it. Like these ladies are saying, it's blood, sweat and tears what they do to create these things. It's not just about the costume. It's the music is the art too. People have to appreciate the art of carnival. And I think we start with education. However that looks, we got to find a way. We got to keep speaking our truth all day, every day. Right. And, and just, well, we're touching on that and, and everybody's, points you know I'm glad that everybody's on the same page and everybody's able to express how they feel about it and really have this space to open up about it but just in closing um, my question for you ladies is as a community what are some effective ways that we can educate and promote carnival um, for its roots and its culture so what are some things that, that need, but so let's go with that question because it's a two-part so I don't want to get into too many different things but as a community what are some effective ways that we can educate and promote carnival for its roots and its culture I think what Carabella said earlier, um, getting you know the younger generations involved, letting them get their community hours, letting them learn how to build a mass, how to be in the mass camp. Um, I think that that's like a huge, that's a really effective way to do that. I know my dad's always wanted to build a community center uh, based around Carnival where kids could do just that. So I think it's a huge thing, um, you know, maybe introducing it to schools, doing programs, um, focused around carnival just for the education aspect I think that's a huge thing yeah and, and just even touching on that like the community center idea like wouldn't it be so amazing where all these mass bands wouldn't have to bounce from mass camp to mass camp to mass camp 
every single year, right? Like imagine just having a space where everybody can have like a friendly competition and, you know, you have your designated areas where you can leave your stuff and you have place for storage and you don't have to worry about like if you're going to have to throw out your stuff or however it may work on your end. Like a lot of things I'm sure you guys have to get rid of just because there's no space to keep it all, right? So um, I think that would be a really cool thing. I love that idea. I think that's amazing. And I think you guys should really push for it. Um, but Carabella, why don't you guys touch on that and what you think are some ways to educate and promote carnival in healthier ways as opposed to just seeing it as sexualized? Okay. Um, well, like, just in regards to, like, the education for, like, the younger generation. So as a part-time job, I am a youth, like, outreach coordinator for a non-for-profit organization called Play Up. And what we do is we go into like lower income areas and provide a free after school and summer program for youth. And for like the summer program, because July is the month where everything's starting to kick off for Caravan, we have a week where we just sit here and decorate headpieces for that for the children to take home. And then, you know, their parents come and they might have a story. Well, yeah, you know, when I was younger, I used to go to Caravan, but I stopped going because of A, B, and C. And then you sit here and you're engaging in conversation with these parents and then you say hey like I have a section you know you should come and play in my section like there's been people who when we did have a kiddie section were from layup there are people who are from the community that you know oh, I, I want my kids to be in it but I don't really know what mass camp to go to I don't really know where to go to register my child and it's just literally just communicating with the community like on like on a, on a level of just educating them and just showing them like okay like resources are here that you can come by and stop by to do a b and c and i also think that you know when you have connections like we all have connections to somewhere whether it be if we're working in a wheelchair store or if we're teaching or if you're working in the medical clinic in a medical clinic like i work at a midwifery clinic so when july comes i decorate the front office with like headpieces feathers gems and you know pregnant women are coming and like oh where'd you guys get this and then we end up saying oh well you know I have a section, it's with Toronto Revelers, you know, come to the mass camp, check out the costumes and whatnot. And I feel like if everybody was Smart. in their workplace, you're gonna get feedback. You're gonna be communicating with people and letting them, showing them like, hey, like this is where you can go. Like, come play with us, come play on mass, come be a part of our culture. So you guys have some, you guys have some um, creative tactics up your sleeve. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you guys are pretty- We try, yeah. we try. Um, <laughs> Just to continue as to what my sister was saying, like on another note, um, right now we are in a pandemic. Um, it's a very crucial time though. Um, the idea of diversity and inclusion has been implemented in so Everywhere. many jobs right now. And especially the school board because Obviously, now we have this voice. We actually have the time, because many of us are at home, we have the time to go out and protest and to say X, Y, Z, and to say that enough is enough, and to ask the government to be more inclusive when it comes down to African-Caribbean, um, Indo-Caribbean, Caribbean, African diasporic studies. I think we have to be well calculated and use this time that we, that we are unfortunately not on the lakeshore this time that we're not actually having a physical caravana and come together and maybe make a proposal to the TDSB, to the TCDSB, to the York Region School Boards and bring the youth in. If it's either through creating a course or if it's through the idea of, hey guys, you guys want to earn your, earn your community service hours? We have links to the Toronto Revelers, to Tribal Carnival, to Carnival Nations, to Saldina. You know, according to where you live in the city, we can set up different spaces for you to go and help build a mass. And within that space, we can have these conversations and we can pass that torch on. Or even provide like a safe environment. And provide, exactly, provide a safe environment. Because even with layup, that's one of the things that they do. They're at at-risk communities. And usually these at-risk communities comprise of West Indian individuals, right? And so, by providing that safe space, right, it kind of steals away from the idea of this, that negativity of, that negativity yeah. of this hypersexualization of the culture. But it's also, well, hey, you can use your creativity, you can use your innovation, and you can use your time productively to per to contribute to an event that at one point hmm, we weren't really educated about, but now we actually see what it is, right? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Perfect. Thank you so much um, for sharing that. I, I believe, um, Selena, why don't you go ahead? Oh, no, you answered this question. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm losing it here. <laughs> Nadell, did you get a chance to answer the um, closing thoughts and your thoughts on um, what we can do to educate the community um, to kind of understand Carnival and Caravana from a different lens? You no, know, I think, you know, like you said, uh, Carabella brought up some really good points. I think one takeaway that I got from something Kateri said is, you know, reaching out to people that we wouldn't normally think of. So like uh, a welding company or, you know, thinking outside of the box to educate people to have or, you know, even putting up or decorating um, with headpieces at your workplace. Um, you know, that'll be, give people the opportunity to have conversations, to educate them and let them know about what our festival is about. And also, you know, using social media. And, you know, I, <laughs> I should know better, but like Terry said, you know, we're in a pandemic. And for me, I kind of mentally had to process that. And, you know, now, um, I'm thinking, you know, we need to continue the conversations. We need to keep the spirit of Carnival going. Even if we're not physically together, we can still be creating that space online and virtually and having conversations like this or, you know, putting our minds together. And, you know, sometimes, you know, as it is a competition, um, you know, sometimes we're, you know, we're fighting and we're not seeing eye to eye, but I think now is the time for the community, the Caribbean community in Toronto to really work together to, you know, like Carrie said, this is a prime time that we're in right now to, you know, get our voices heard, get proper sponsorship, start, you know, correcting our festival because we have something good and we have to keep it going. Amazing. Thank you so, so much. And Bianco, I don't believe you answered the question. So if you just wanted to leave us with some closing thoughts about how you think, um, we can kind of tap. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay, perfect. I think everybody, everybody um, kind of is on the same page. And I, like I said, and I'm really, really happy about that. Um, I think this conversation was amazing. I've been like taking notes, literally, because I, I know I'm still going to go back and watch it again to take even more notes. But just like listening to some of the things that you guys were saying, these are things that I didn't even think about. Um, um, some amazing points that you guys brought up, and I'm really happy. Um, I think I couldn't have had anybody else on this panel because I think you guys did amazing. Um, you all worked so well together to bring all these ideas to life for us. Um, and I just want to open the floor. There was one question, um, but I just like if anybody else has a question, I just want to tackle that really quickly. But um, how can mass camps and even um, the FMC even connect with Caribbean artists? Um, so like dance, theater, poetry, etc to help with educating the public through art. And this is um, Paulina. She's actually one of my mentors. So I'm really happy that she's on this panel, hey, um, like asking questions. So, hey, Paulina, but um, just to repeat the question one more time, how can Mass Camps and the FMC even connect with Caribbean artists, um, such as dance, theater, poetry, et cetera, to help with educating the public through arts? So um, maybe Carabella, since you guys do a lot of work like in the community, um, if you, if you feel that you can answer this, I'm gonna pass it on to you guys because I know you're saying you do uh, like a lot of community work. So how can we um, connect with Caribbean artists to help educating, to help with educating? Wow. <laughs> um, okay, let me read. Okay, hey, well, while she's thinking, I'll give you a minute to think. We need a diary. Yes. We don't even know where to find half the people. Like if you're looking, we do, we need somewhere we could go to find the designer, the pan player, the, the poet. We don't have a directory of finding everybody. That'd be a, a great start. Yeah, maybe right? like, a, like using social media, for instance, and creating yeah. a directory of Caribbean uh -huh. artists, right? Yeah. Um, maybe for like, maybe like Black History Month within schools, because education system celebrates Black History Month, maybe they can have somebody go out to the school and play pan and they can have a section leader or a band leader go in and display costumes and explain to them the process that goes on behind making masks. So they can have somebody who's a masquerader to talk to them about being a part of the being a part of the grand parade, being a part of the lecture, being a part of kitties. Um, what else can I do? I was gonna say there's a, uh, oh, where is that? I forget the exact name, maybe Paulina. Hi girl. Uh, you might be able to help me out. In Regent Park, they have the, um, they have this art, the artscape, 
uh, Daniel Spectrum. Yeah, Daniel, Daniel Spectrum. Spectrum. And maybe, maybe, you know, uh, Mass Fan Leader is the FMC, um, by the way, we need to have a better relationship with one another, to be honest with you, because we're not always on the same page with one another. And that's the truth, right? We're only as strong as our weakest link. And in unity, there is strength. Um, but hey, I'm just a section leader. So I mean, you know what? Like, even for the Joe Fresh, um, one of our friends who was a part of the marketing team, he's the one that came together and said, hey, like, I want to do something to dedicate the month of July to Caravan. And that's the reason why she reached out to us. And that was like, we got a lot of good feedback at that panel in regards to it. Like we brought our costume, we explained to them what goes on behind the, the scenes of, of, of just the fashion of it. Because Joe Fish is a fashion line, right? Like, and they seen what we were doing. Um, no, but we also have to find a way to bridge that, to bridge that gap. So we have the Caribbean designers, the Caribbean welders, the mass leaders and band leaders and section leaders and buyers. But then we also have the Caribbean artists, the poets, the singers, the actors. So we have to be able to find a way to bridge the two together. How? I don't know. I Start really with don't. social media. It's the best the way. Social media, the social directory. Media directory. Maybe, you know, we create a directory, you know. Um, like I said, Daniel Spectrum. We, you know, some of the leaders go to Daniel Spectrum and say, hey, guys, let's Let's do, because like, for instance, with the Revelers, we usually have, um, we have the Soka Dome Sundays, right? And we also, um, Jamal uh, usually delegates a weekend or a day, either Saturday, usually Saturday, where section leaders can put on a, 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 their, own their own events, right? So we have an event at the mass camp where it's like, hey, we do a poetry night or we do some acting and, you know, we fuse the two art forms together, oh you know, and... Yeah, like yeah. You said, that's amazing. I mean, there's also like, I mean, another idea like, that I mean, that sorry that Carabella Mass was even thinking about doing before this whole pandemic had happened was our event would have been based off of mental health because you know people do like Kateri for instance not putting your business out there, it's okay. but Kateri sure. does live with depression, right? So it's just like yeah. how does Mass help us deal with the mental health that we're going through. Even now, it's like we were going through the pandemic and we were, we're having this conversation through Zoom. Why don't we have a, a night where it's like, okay, we have materials or we can build a headpiece or we, you know, go in our closet and get an old bra and, and buy, get gems and decorate the old bra just so that we're keeping our minds busy, just so that, you know, you're able to sit here and just be happy in a sense and just kind of forget about what's going on with the pandemic. I don't think anybody has done that as of yet in regard to having like a Zoom, I guess, conversation or, an, or a Zoom make a mass party. We could do that in regards to... Or even going people. back to basics where we sit there and we showcase all our different shapes and sizes and we put on our, our costume and we feel sexy and, and whatever, you know, there's so many different avenues that we can use. Um, it's just being able to use our resources. Yeah. Yeah. But also being able to link it too, right? And, and being like, united. Like Bianca said, social media, that directory, right? If we could establish a directory, that would be great. Um, we also have to take the initiative to approach each other, right? I don't know. I know a few artists in the city. I know a few poets in the city. And maybe say, yo, let's do a fusion. Let's, let's do... Um, a poetic night that's geared towards the celebration of mass, the, the, the art of whining, you know? Um, Bianca. <laughs> you know what? I was gonna say, we need more collaboration with a lot of things that we're facing in the world with the pandemic, with, with racism, with, with civil uprising, social injustice. Sometimes within our communities, we need more collaboration. We're not good at doing that. And that's a big issue. We need more collaboration. If we collaborated more, came together, we could build this directory. We could have right. a hub. Right. right? And, then, and then the other thing- starts too, with us, but we all got to be willing to do it. Right. And like Vanessa had mentioned, the idea of mental health, a lot of us, because we are in this pandemic right now, as much as we may not want to admit it, we might be feeling the blues. We might be sad that we can't travel to crop over to Grenada. <laughs> you know, Trinidad, you know, usually I know myself, I'm always on a plane somewhere, but um, I've had seven vacations canceled. So yeah, I'm feeling oh it. Oh my Thank God. Yeah. So, yeah. so we yeah. can find ways to uplift one another and even start that conversation of mental yeah. health. 
right? Which is something that is taboo within our community. Our community. One as women, as Caribbean women, you know, yep. and see if we could use mass or as a way to cope with as it. a way to cope with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as mothers, I mean, how can you be a mother and say that mentally you're you're going through things? Because then first thing somebody wants to say, well, you can't have your kids then. But we face a lot of things every day, mm-hmm. and it's tough, right? So, yeah, we need more of these conversations. We do. So we need start. more kind of discussions like this, Ashley. Yeah, we need okay. real Definitely. and real issues. We're not, we're not doing it for the gram or for somebody. We're not posturing anything for money. Nobody's getting any kind of personal gain except sharing and empowering women and our culture and Caribbean people as a whole. That's what we're doing. Right? Yeah. So, so all in all, um, what I've summed up from this conversation is collaboration, community, connection, and education. So those are all the things. A whole lot of love. A whole lot of love. Yeah. And we have to be willing to connect with our people and know that there's enough pieces of the pie to go around. Right. I think that's something that the community, well, that's a different conversation for another day. So I don't even want to get into that, but there's enough pieces of the pie to go around for everybody in the community to work together. And and it's really important for us to see that. Um, But I just want to, again, say thank you to all the panelists on this discussion. I'm so happy that I, I have you guys on today. I think you guys did amazing. You raised so many important points. I can't wait to um, get this recording and post it onto our page right away because I can't wait for you guys to share it with your network if they weren't able to hop on. Um, But yes, please drop um, to the panelists. Make sure you guys are dropping to all the attendees. Um, Carabella, yeah, you guys are going to just have to click the arrow and then do all panelists and attendees. So um, here, I'll, I'm just going to copy and paste it for you guys. So um, <laughs> you feel like I'm not very technically swamped. You realize we can see your face as you're doing that, right? <laughs> I, get it from my, I get it from my mother and my father, God rest his soul, you know, and they're looking like, you know, so. <laughs> so um, uh, for sure, 100%. I just want to, again, thank you to everybody who, like, stayed locked into this conversation. Um. It was amazing. Again, thank you so much. I got so many notes. I'm so excited to just like do something with it, right? Not just have this conversation and leave it there. Do something with it for us to collaborate, for us to work together. Um, I have like people messaging me, asking asking me for your guys' names, your ads, so you could drop it there and people want to connect. So I'm really happy that we're able to have this conversation and create this space. You are all amazing. I just want to say good night. And again, thank you all for being a part of this conversation. So again, thank you, Ashley, for... um putting this panel together and also thank you for BG Diaries and having a place and a safe space for people. I think you're doing an amazing job. Thank you. And, and I, and I couldn't do it without everything that you guys are doing and continually being inspiring women to me. So thank you guys so much. I love you all. Have an amazing night. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.